Our next speaker is Hamid Takavi, a Marxist thinker and leader of the Worker Communist Party of Iran. He is a political and social commentator and analyst who's had a significant impact on the development of a Marxist critique of religion in Iran and across the Middle East. He was an influential figure on the left and the opposition movement in Iran in the 1970s and subsequently following the Iranian Revolution of 1979. He's written numerous articles and has been interviewed extensively on the situation in Iran and other issues. Please welcome Hamid. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, the title of my speech is uh, Rise and Fall of Secularism. And uh, under this title, I try to explain uh, those conditions that uh, led to the emergence of secularism a few hundred years ago, and the conditions that today... Is it okay now? Okay, no, not yet. It's not my fault. Uh, uh, I was saying that uh, I'm trying to explain uh, or, or try to explain the, uh, the conditions that led to the emergence of secularism a few hundreds ago and the conditions today that led to the downfall of secularism. Of course, by downfall, I mean its place in the mainstream uh, politics and, 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 and doctrines of today, dominant politics of today. And then I try to explain the roots, the uh, social and economical reason, or you can say the political economy of modernism and postmodernism. And I try to do all of that in, in 10 minutes. <laughs> and uh, I hope I can do this, so I better start. Uh, secularism is an achievement of the modern era and the pillar of civil society. But today, we are in a postmodern era. The era of denial of modern universal values. So, so politically, secularism is no longer in the mainstream. It is in the opposition. It is an idea that we have to fight for again. The same is true for civil society as a whole. Civil society is, or it used to be, based on modernism, civil laws, and national states as opposed to the religious, ethnic, sectarian societies of the Middle Ages. Citizens were at least legally equal members of society, regardless of their religion or ethnicity or cultural background. Politically, the golden rule of democracy was one person or one citizen, one vote. One society, one law. But not anymore, not according to Postmodernism. Now society is considered an amalgamation of different identities based on religions and ethnic groups, and the state is defined as a coalition or combination of the heads of those groups. The, the best case, or you better say the worst case in hand is Iraq. In the last decade in Iraq, the state and the ruling apparatus uh, was officially uh, uh, consisted of, of uh, 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 court president, uh, uh, the Shia prime minister, and the Sunni uh, head of parliament. And in the northern Iraq, uh, in Kurdistan of Iraq, we had a ruler from the other sector of uh, uh, courts. Those in Kurdistan, we had it for 20 years from the Gulf War, since the Gulf War. And in the rest of Iraq, we had that situation since the uh, 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 2003 invasion to Iraq. So it's not an accident that, that you have those posts for those different sects for 20 years and for 10 years. It is officially a deal uh, between the US and its allies and the different groups in Iraq. And we have still that situation, of course, with ISIS. That balance is broken. That balance is disturbed now. And the US is trying to add more Salafis and more Basis uh, to, to the pot. Uh, in other words, trying to solve the problem by adding to the cause of the problem. 
This is the new meaning of democracy and society, not only for the Middle East and underdeveloped countries, but here in the West as well. We have to fight against Sharia courts in Canada for one country, one law in Britain, and against considering the imams and muftis as the representatives of immigrants from so-called Islamic countries <coughs> all over Europe. Immigrants who have, in the first place, mostly fled from the rule of Sharia in their own countries. Identifying people not as an equal citizen, but as religious ethnic identities with different values and ideals and needs is the core of this regression to the Middle Ages. Ideologically, postmodernism denies the universal values established by the Renaissance and Enlightenment and replaces them with cultural relativism. According to the postmodernism, <coughs> happiness, <coughs> suffering, freedom, equality, and even humanism as a whole are not reducible to the same human experiences and values. And there is no common model or standard, no common cause to fight for or to achieve. Secularism not only as the separation of church and state, but as the identification and recognition of people as human being is denied. Human being regardless of the way they believe or not believe in God. Of course, there's only one way that you cannot believe in God, but there are so many different ways that you can believe in God, and that's other root of our problem today. Uh, the question is, why is this? What is the socioeconomic root of this? Why, despite the fact that people all over the world connect like never before through social media, and despite the fact that material living, material living conditions such as electricity, cars, computers, and so on, are the same for all the people on the world, and despite the fact that the meaning and the standards of prosperity and welfare has become increasingly universal, nevertheless, the idea of being different, of multiculturalism and relativism gained more ground, at least in the mainstream ideology, mainstream politics and media. I think the answer lies in the very economic relations that made the world a global village. At the time of the Renaissance and Enlightenment, the time of the rise of secularism, most of the world, in fact the whole world except Europe, was still in the pre-capitalist medieval phase and the world had to change. What is called westernization, which was nothing but going forward, was the imperative of the times. Westernization is just another name for globalization of universal values. Western system of values is in fact a global achievement, the last step in the long history of the development of human culture. From ancient China and Egypt and Greece uh, to the industrial and uh, intellectual revolution in the West. The European bourgeoisie, through its vanguard thinkers, recognized and uh, pro uh, uh, pro promoted this universalism of values because it was in full compliance with its economic and political interests. The young bourgeoisie of Europe had every intention and every political and economical will to conquer the world, to conquer the old world and develop it into a modern and suitable place for the bourgeois economy. Landlords and noblemen, along with their religion and aristocratic values, had to step aside and give way to changes necessary for the labor and commodity uh, market to take shape. That's the political economy of secularism and universalism. For the young bourgeoisie of the West and its one god philosophers and thinkers, Western culture and civilization was a true model and ideal for the rest of the world because the rest of the world was not ready for business. Roads and railways and infrastructure for capital had to be built. Health and literacy had to be improved. And most important of all, peasants had to be freed from the land and transformed into wage laborers. Those were the very changes in the West that necessitated secularism and modernism. The vanguard and the revolutionary West wanted to export its values in order to export its capital. Now that era is over. 500 years after the Renaissance, when capital and capitalism is everywhere, the bourgeoisie has no perspective and no outlook for growth, and therefore feels no need for universalism. In the beginning of 21st century, when capitalism is in the 
is a dominant force in every country, and still Korea and Tehran and Addis Ababa and Liba are no London and Paris and New York, promoting Western culture from the bourgeois standpoint makes no sense anymore. Better not to raise expectations. Now is the time for cultural relativism, re-enter religions and tribes and ethnic values and whatever make people look different. Re-enter them to justify misery as relative, as relative and local happiness, lack of rights as freedom and suffering as welfare. The new world order of the free market can no longer afford to defend and promote Western values as an outlook for, for any society. A few hundred years ago, even 50 years ago, when there still were countries in medieval conditions, we had many different economic models of growth, but the same system of social and cultural values. The Western system of values, which underdeveloped countries, in order to be transformed into Western-like, capital-friendly societies, had to look up to. Now, it is the opposite. We have different system of values, but the same economic model. Friedmanism and economy, economics of Chicago School, austerity for everybody. Economically, every society is in the same boat, but otherwise, you are on your own with your own religion and ethnic background and your own definition of happiness and freedom and so on and so forth. We seculars are facing this regressive world. Our goal is not only separation of religion and state, but defining civil society and the very sense of humanity and humanistic values. We are fighting for modernism, not against pre-modern feudal forces, but against the post-modern capital forces. In this fight, the truth and reality, science and technology are with us. The very fact that the occupation of Al-Tahrir Square in the heart of Egypt's revolution became an inspiration for Zakuti Park in the heart of the Occupy movement in New York shows the relativism is nonsense. It also shows how we can overcome it. Thank you. <laughs>